seems a little strange that we are starting a new sermon series already, because uh, we've had some long ones, but this last sermon series was pretty short, just a, a six-part series in Romans 8, uh, just that one chapter of Romans. Uh, we're beginning a series now on Galatians. We'll go through the whole book of Galatians, but it's still uh, a fairly short book compared to others. Uh, but Galatians 1 is where we will be this morning. And uh, just by way of introduction, I want to just go ahead and read the introduction to this letter from the Apostle Paul. Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers who are with me, to the churches of Galatia. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. All right, so um, just a few comments on this introduction before we get to the meat of our passage this morning. I want you to notice a couple of things. So first of all, this is a pretty standard opening to uh, a letter. Right? Paul opens up many of his epistles this way. Uh, he begins by identifying himself. But I want you to notice, because we'll come back to this this morning. Notice uh, he immediately moves into his credentials. He says, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father. Or right before that, he calls himself an apostle, right? Which, which is uh, a designation of authority, right? He has apostolic authority that does not, does not come through man, but comes from God. So he gives that, and then he kind of moves along in the standard greeting. But I want you to notice that he gives um, somewhat of a gospel summary uh, in this introduction. And so at the end of verse 1, of course, he speaks of the resurrection of Jesus. And then uh, verse 4, he says, uh, Who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age. And so even within his introduction here, he kind of weaves in a, a gospel summary and that's what this whole book is going to be about. This book is all about the gospel. And so as you'll see, uh, the, the title actually for both of this opening sermon and for the whole series is No Other Gospel. And uh, so we'll see that throughout the book. Now, the word gospel. Um, I think uh, many of us here, maybe most of us, uh, know what the word gospel means. It's uh, at least for me, it's been driven in ever since I was a child. The word gospel simply means good news. And it is good news. It's great news, isn't it? Um, now, the word gospel in Greek is actually, it's the word euangelion, which uh, maybe this is something you didn't realize. The word evangelism, right? You hear that? Evangelism, euangelion, right? The word evangelism actually comes from the word for gospel, right? And so evangelism is sharing the good news, Okay, but major point here, it means good news, and the gospel is good news. And there's something very basic about this gospel message, right? I mean, we, we saw it woven into this introduction, right? This is Jesus' uh, death and resurrection for the forgiveness of sins. That's the very basic uh, part of the gospel message. But one thing that uh, I really want to hone in on this morning, and, and we'll see this throughout our series The basicness of the gospel message should never lead us to think or act as if the gospel is simply an entry into the Christian faith that we move past. All right, that's something that uh, we, we must understand. While on one hand, yes, the gospel uh, is basic and it's something simple that even a child can understand, it is not, therefore, something that we think of just as something that we move past. It's not simply an entry into the Christian life. As one commentator puts it, the gospel is not merely the ABCs of Christianity. Rather, it is the A to the Z, right? It encompasses everything. Now, I remember actually learning the ABCs of uh, Christianity as a child, as an acronym, right? And so maybe you've heard this before. Uh, the A is admit, right? Admit to God that I'm a sinner. The B is believe, believe that Jesus came and died and rose again for the forgiveness of sins. And then finally, confess. The C is confess that Jesus is Lord and trust in him for salvation. That's, that is a beautiful, beautiful summary of 
of the gospel. As long as we, again, don't end up thinking of it as a one-and-done kind of thing. Because if we think of the gospel as only that, then we can fall into this trap of like, oh yeah, I believed the gospel way back when. Uh, I, I uh, entered into the Christian faith through this gospel message. It's so much more than that. It's not something we set aside. It's not just the ABCs, but it is indeed the A to Z. And so the problem in Galatia, right? So, so here Paul is writing uh, these churches in this, uh, in this region, Galatia. And the problem there is that this hasn't quite sunk in, right? That, that uh, there is an A to Z of the gospel. And, um, and maybe because they had kind of moved past some things or not... Uh, they, ha- they hadn't allowed the gospel to really permeate every aspect of their Christian life. They, they were uh, ultimately deceived by another gospel. Now we'll see that this other gospel, it, it wasn't an altogether different gospel. Uh, that is to say, the, the gospel that the, the Galatians were deceived by, it was very much the same in many respects to the one true gospel of Jesus Christ. It's just that it had some additions to it. And, and we'll see in the weeks to come that with the gospel, addition is subtraction. Okay, I, w- I want that to get locked into your mind. We'll come back to that uh, a few times even this morning. All right? With the gospel, addition is subtraction. Now I'll let your wheels turn a little bit and I'll, uh, I'll explain further what that means as we move along. But let's go ahead and read uh, our main passage now. If you would stand with me in honor of reading God's word, continue past this introduction into verses 6 through 9. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you into the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. Let's pray. God, as we continue in this passage, as we dig into um, the the heart of the gospel, I pray that you would help us uh, to understand... um, Uh, Not just the basics of the gospel, but how it is to permeate uh, every aspect of our lives. Help us to also beware of some of the dangers that this uh, passage uh, presents to us. Uh, We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we really have two warnings, we might say, in this passage. And so the first is beware of gospel distortions. And the second really goes hand in hand with it, that is beware of false teachers, those who deliver these false gospels or even these uh, distortions of the gospel. And so first, beware of gospel distortions. Now, when we look at this section that we just read, especially just verse 6, if you were just to read verse 6 by itself, let's just look at it again. It says, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. If we were just to read that verse alone, we would think that this was just some altogether different gospel that was adopted in Galatia. And that's true in a sense because, I mean, of course, here he calls it a different gospel. But we need to understand that it's not that the Galatians were being convinced like to start worshiping Zeus or something like that. Or, nor were they denying the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, right? Again, if we just look at verse 6, we might think, okay, this, this is something radically different. But it wasn't at least radically different in that sense. Rather, it's a distortion of the one true gospel. The people in Galatia, I mean, they were acknowledging Jesus as Lord, that he... Uh, died and was buried and raised again for the forgiveness of sins. They acknowledged all of that. And yet Paul does indeed call it here a different gospel. Let's just continue reading through verse 7. He says, not that there is another one, right? not that there really is another gospel, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. 
And there's that word distort that I think is very helpful. We see that there's a distortion of the gospel. And, and in this case, um, we don't really gather this from our passage this morning, but as we move along in Galatians, we'll see that the distortion is really this addition to the gospel. Not that there were some additions to the gospel. And again, with the gospel, addition is subtraction. Um, this is kind of ironic how, how this coincides with what we were uh, talking about just this past Wednesday in our Wednesday night uh, study. That, that often happens, I guess. But uh, I, I shared a lot about Mormonism, uh, and it was relevant to some of the things we were talking about Wednesday night. And it's relevant to our passage this morning. Um, just by way of illustration, I think it illustrates some of the things that were going on in Galatia, but also it's helpful for us to know because that's something that we do encounter today when, when maybe some of these specific issues that the, the Galatians were facing aren't so much what we face today. Um, so just let me, let me tell you a, a story. And, and I may have shared this one time before, but uh, I think this is very helpful. Whenever I lived in uh, Willow Springs, Missouri... Uh, serving at a church there. Um, one time I came in, uh, one time I heard a knock at my door. Right? We've all had that knock on our door uh, from the Mormons or, or similarly the, the Jehovah's Witnesses. These were two, two young men, uh, just such just nice guys. Um, I invited them in. We, we sat around my kitchen table and probably talked for about an hour. And then um, as they were leaving, I said, hey, I would love to keep meeting. Um, but here's what I knew. I, I knew that, I mean, understandably, I guess, that as Mormon missionaries, their higher-ups, they, they weren't going to, like, be all crazy about them meeting with a Baptist pastor uh, and going through some kind of book or something that, that told them why they were wrong. And so, so what I did instead, I, I was, I was uh, familiar with this book. It was a book I had on my shelf that I hadn't even read yet. But it was a book that actually um, had a Mormon author and an evangelical Christian author, and each chapter they would both kind of share their uh, differences and what they believed about you know different uh, aspects of the gospel or the scripture and so on. And so uh, I asked them. I said, "Hey, uh, you know, this book is is written by a, a Mormon author and an evangelical Christian author. Y'all want to sit down and, and talk about this?" Uh, and we just kind of go chapter by chapter, and they agreed. And so. I don't know, 8, 12, I don't remember how many chapters it was, but, but for, for a number of weeks, we would just meet together and we would talk. And I even, uh, at their invitation, was reading parts of the Book of Mormon. I'll tell you one thing, though, that was very um, uh, eye-opening for me when it came to, so here's a big difference between what Mormons teach about the gospel versus what I think is clearly the um, uh, biblical message. And, uh, you know, Mormons will say that they believe in the scriptures. They, they, they hold to the Old and New Testament, but they also have you know, the Book of Mormon and the Pearl of Great Price. They, they, have, they have actually quite a few other books that they add to uh, their canon of scripture, we might say. And um, so in the Book of Mormon, uh, which is one of these, the Book of Mormon, uh, I was reading along and uh, 2 Nephi 25-23 says this, for we know that it is by grace that we are saved. Now, hold on. That sounds pretty familiar, right? That sounds like Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. For, for we know that it is by grace we have been saved after all we can do. Remember that illustration I gave to the kids about the, the bike? Actually, that's a common Mormon illustration. Uh, the one that I said was wrong. <laughs> the one that says, okay, we save up our money and, and, and we do all that we can and then God takes care of the rest. So that's the gospel that they preach. But I think clearly in the New Testament, and here's really what Galatians is honing in on, that, hey, no, it's not that. It's not that we contribute anything at all. We, we don't have things that we, like, have to do uh, to contribute to our salvation. Rather, it's paid for all by Jesus. It's, it's all by the blood of Jesus. And there aren't, there aren't these additions. There aren't these additional requirements that uh, in any way contribute to our salvation. And so... Um, Again, you know, the, the, the better illustration would be that we, we say, hey, I have nothing at all to offer. I don't have any money. I don't have any way of making any money. But I need this bicycle. <laughs> I want this bicycle. And then, you know, your parents graciously give it to you. 
That's, that, that's, that's, that's the free gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay? So, um, again, just in this one verse in the Book of Mormon, it says, For we know that it is by grace we are saved after all we can do. Okay, so this is what I mean when I say that with the gospel, addition is subtraction. Right? So this is what you know, Mormons do today, but this, this is what was going on in Galatia. Right? There was this addition to the gospel. And when you, whenever you add to it, when you say, well, after all that I can do, as long as I check all these boxes, then, then you know, God will take care of the rest. Well, that's, that's addition. And with the gospel, it is indeed subtraction. Um, so, here's what was going on in Galatia. Yes, faith was part of the equation, but, but there were um, people called Judaizers who were saying, well, no, in addition to having faith in Jesus, you've got to do this, this, and this. Two problems with this. One, first of all, there is a place for works in the Christian faith. As I've often put it, works are a necessary fruit or evidence Right, so kind of on the on the, uh, I always say you don't want to get the cart before the horse. Right, it's not that I got to do these things and then I'm saved. But rather, it's that I'm saved and therefore fruits going to flow from that. Good works are going to flow from that. That's what we see, even in Ephesians two eight and nine. Right, it's by grace you've been saved through faith. It's a gift of God. It's not by works that no one should boast. But then it goes on to say that we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Okay, so so, so here's the thing, in Galatia, yes, while it is true that good works are necessary evidence or fruit of faith. The problem in Galatia was that it, it, was, it was a prerequisite. It was a prerequisite for salvation. As if, as if our good works contribute in some way to our salvation and nothing could be further from the truth. It's not a prerequisite, right? It's, it's come as you are, and Jesus comes and clean. And Jesus is the one who cleans you up. Uh, it's Jesus is the one who paid the price for the forgiveness of our sins, and it is through Him that we are then changed and become more and more like Christ in our day to day lives. So we can't get the cart before the horse. We can't we can't make this a prerequisite. So that that was part of the problem, but but. But what made this an even bigger issue in Galatia is that the law that was being imposed upon the Galatians, it wasn't even something that's, uh, that's, that's even binding for us any longer in the New Testament. Right? It would be one thing if, if in Galatia he was saying, hey, you've got to love your neighbor as yourself. You've got, you, you, you got to do these things. Which again, still, that, that would be hugely problematic if, if this was somehow a prerequisite that contributed to salvation. Right? That's still a false gospel. But what made it even worse was that in Galatia, it wasn't just like the love your neighbor as yourself kind of thing, but it was, uh, you, you have to follow the law of Moses. Specifically, we'll see at the forefront is circumcision, right? Which that sounds really weird to us that that would even be any concern at all, right? But circumcision was uh, the mark of the covenant. And, and it, was, it was something that, of course, in the Old Testament, uh, Jewish people would, uh, would be circumcised as as a way of, of marking this covenant relationship between them and God. And so now in the New Testament, when we have Gentiles, we have non-Jewish people who are coming to faith in Christ, well, we have these people saying, okay, you Gentiles, which, I mean, this is, you know, grown adults, right? Saying, now as a grown adult, <laughs> you've got to be circumcised. Uh, you've got to uh, conform to the law of Moses in order to be saved. And so... Again, not only is it uh, making some kind of prerequisite, but it's something that that's not even required on the tail end, right? Because uh, we are now in a new covenant, and the new, T new Testament makes clear that these ceremonial laws, same with the food laws and things like that, right? There, there were certain laws for the Jewish people that are no longer in effect for us today. All right, so, so as I said before, maybe this kind of... Uh, helps you understand more how this specific issue is not so much at the forefront today, right? I mean, I don't, I don't think there's anybody here in 21st century America saying, hey, you've got to be circumcised if you want to follow Jesus. 
Now, we might do it for other reasons, right? There's uh, health reasons and whatnot that, uh, that Gentiles do that today. But, uh, but it has nothing to do with, you know, this covenant relationship with God and is any kind of prerequisite for salvation. That's not an issue today. But we've, we've, we've got to understand how this might apply to us in different ways. Well, I mean, I mean just think about legalism in general. Right? I mean, that's, what, that's what's going on here. There's, there's the legalism in Galatia where there's the law of Moses that's being imposed and saying you must follow these things in order to be a Christian. These are prerequisites. Well, um, we, we may have... Uh, man-made laws of our own. I mean, uh, you know, I, the church I pastored before this, uh, we celebrated 150th anniversary uh, uh, while I was there, and it was, it was a really incredible thing, but uh, in preparation for that, I actually did a lot of research on the church. I was looking back at church minutes, and I saw, you know, 100 years ago or so, there were people being kicked out of the church for playing cards. So that would be an example of, okay, this is a man-made law, can't play cards. This is a man-made law that was being imposed in a way that it sh- should, should never have been imposed. That's a kind of legalism, and, and so that might creep up in, in all kinds of ways in different generations. These man-made laws that we impose upon ourselves and upon others. And even worse, if we, if we say that this is a prerequisite to being saved, we must understand that our works are completely impotent to save us. Our works contribute nothing at all. That's, that, that's, that's a key um, message here in Galatians. Our works contribute nothing. You know, uh, we might have this tendency to, to want to rely on our works because, I mean, goodness, this, this might be even more of a 21st century American thing than it was for them in the sense that we, we want to we be self-reliant, Right? We, 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 we want to depend upon ourselves and no other. And so that kind of attitude, those kinds of values can kind of creep in in such a way that we think, okay, well, you know, as long as I uh, check this box and this box and this box, then I'm good. And, and it gives us some kind of satisfaction that, hey, I've done something. But we have to completely depend upon Jesus. Now again, this doesn't mean that works don't come to the equation somehow. They come on the tail end, right? As, 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 uh, as gratitude for what God has done in our hearts. As evidence of uh, a resurrected spirit, right? That, a new heart. But never should they be prerequisites. Never should they be something that we rely upon. And then there are all kinds of other distortions of the gospel. Not just legalism, but um, we have different distortions in our own day. Because, again, here in this passage, uh, look again at verse, what verse was it? Verse 7. He says, not that there's another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, what are some ways that the gospel is distorted today? Well, Certainly there are uh, liberal interpretations of the gospel that, that s- seek to break away from uh, the faith once and for all delivered to the saints and, and kind of uh, redress it for modern sensibilities. There's the prosperity gospel, right? the idea that, okay, if, if we um, say, say these prayers or give this money or, or you know, do these things, then we're going to be healthy and wealthy. And, and, and that's really what it's all about, is God blessing us in these ways in the here and now. All kinds of distortions of the gospel that we must be aware of. And so we, can, we take this generally as well and say, hey, just as there were distortions then, there are distortions of all kinds today. They may at first glance seem to be the gospel of Jesus Christ, but in reality, they are a different gospel. Number two, beware of false teachers. And so, again, this goes hand in hand with uh, the first, beware of gospel distortions, right? These are those who teach these gospel distortions. But let's read on verses 8 through 9. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. 
So there's some strong language here. First of all, what really jumps out to me is he says, even if an angel from heaven preached to you another gospel, let him be accursed. Now we'll come back to the let him be accursed and what that, uh, the, the warning that it gives to the false teachers themselves. But as far as you and I are concerned, it means don't listen to them, right? Don't listen to such a person, even an angel from heaven. Now here's what's crazy. If I can kind of bring it back to uh, Mormonism as kind of a modern day illustration, this is exactly the claim of Mormonism. That an angel named Moroni came and said, hey, all these other you know, uh, churches, all these other Christians got it wrong. Here's how it is. Isn't that crazy? Right? That's the exact claim that it was an angel from heaven that came to s- share this other gospel. Now, I don't know if there really was some genuine experience that uh, Joseph Smith had or if he was just making this up. Um, that's a discussion for another day. But even if he did have the experience that he claimed, you know, with this angel Moroni, well, this passage says, even if an angel from heaven came and shared another gospel, let him be accursed. Now, to be clear, I, I don't think that Paul is saying that an angel from heaven actually would do this. And if an angel did do this, it would by virtue become a fallen angel. But I don't think Paul is meaning to give a theology of angels here. Um, I, I think this is just a hyperbol- hyperbolic hypothetical. <laughs> right, you get it? A hyperbolic hypothetical. He's, he, he's, he's using a hyperbole saying, even if, you know, even if an angel came down from heaven and said this, don't believe it. Right? He's really emphasizing the point. So that's, that's what I think he's doing here. But that said... You know, there are, all, there are again, to come back to fallen angels that we would uh, call demons, uh, that very much would like to promote a false gospel. And so, um, again, I don't know what Joseph Smith, uh, what was going on uh, with his story, um, but another example might be Muhammad, right? Muhammad, he's claiming to have these revelations in a cave. Uh, very well could be some kind of, quote-unquote, angel, right? Uh, a, a demon, some kind of demonic influence. Um, the point, though, is even if an angel from heaven, or even if you have some kind of uh, supernatural experience, or even, you know, don't believe any other gospel. The point is the gospel is unchangeable. And so beware of anyone telling you anything new. Now, I highlighted Paul's mention of angels. But the fact that he mentions himself is no less jolting. Or here he uses the word we. Because remember in verse 2 he says, you know, all the brothers who are with me. And so although Paul's the primary author of this letter, there are others who are uh, alongside him here. And, and so he and his um, uh, ministry companions, when he says in verse 8, even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you another gospel contrary to the one that we preached to you, let him be accursed. Well, that's pretty jolting too, right? That he would include himself in this. Because just consider how he opened this letter with his credentials as an apostle, right? So on one hand, like, he's, he's writing this letter with apostolic authority, saying, hey, this is not from uh, God, but from, or sorry, not from man, but it's from God. And then later as he shares his testimony, he again makes it clear that the gospel message that he has Is from God. The authority that he has is from God. But what's most important is the gospel message. Because what he's saying here is that even if he is an apostle, even though he has this authority, even as an apostle, if he were to preach another gospel, he says, let me be accursed. He he, he does not have the authority to supersede the gospel once and for all delivered to the saints. The gospel that uh, uh, he received and the gospel that he and his The other apostles are preaching. Now, as with the angels from heaven, I'm sure Paul would insist that he would never preach another gospel. But again, this is a hypothetical, maybe a hyperbolic hypothetical. Even if he did, if he did, let him be accursed. 
So there's something to this that Paul highlights. He highlights the last people that you would expect to preach another gospel, right? An angel from heaven, uh, or he and his companions, right? If he's saying these people who you would think would be the last people that would go against the gospel, or maybe the last people that you would be suspicious of. Why does he highlight them? Well, I think it's instructive for us because we need to realize that the very last people that we would be suspicious of can indeed end up distorting the gospel in very dangerous ways. And so if he's saying, hey, if an angel from heaven or or if if we preach a different gospel, let him be accursed, then that should be kind of an eye-opener for us that, okay, you know what, maybe there's people in my life, people that I really trust. But I can't, I can't just put blinders on. And, you know, so, so whether it's a, a TV preacher or an author or me, whoever it might be, like, yes, God puts people in our lives to, to instruct us and, and, and people that we should trust to a certain degree. But, but here's the point, right? We, we, we've got to always be measuring everything up to God's word, everything up to the gospel once and for all delivered to the saints. And, and we can't just blindly trust anyone because, well, there's a possibility that they could distort the gospel and lead us in a very dangerous direction. And so, this is the standard. The gospel is clear here in his word, and we must rely upon his word. And just let me say that, you know, there's a reason why I tend to preach through books of the Bible instead of just kind of giving my own opinion on you know, how to make your life better and stuff like that. Because this is where the authority is. What I, what I think doesn't matter at all. Right? Now, now, yes, I can, I can give some good insight. The Lord can use me to open your eyes to what's in the Scripture. But it's got to be the Scriptures. Right? So that's true when I preach. But then it's true even as you as you reflect on what I preach, and then as you go about your day-to-day life, as you, uh, have, you know, walk your Christian life, you, you've got to rely on God's Word, on the unchanging truth of God's Word, because, I, I mean, this, our culture today is certainly, no, it's certainly not less dangerous than the culture in the first century in Galatia. It, it, it may very well be more dangerous in terms of gospel distortions and, and uh, false teachers and people who can lead you astray, sometimes in very subtle ways, but right, that's kind of the point here. These, these gospel distortions can, uh, on one hand, you know, they, they appear to be the, the one true gospel of Jesus Christ, but uh, maybe they add a little something or they tweak a little something or they change something so that it... Um, uh, indeed becomes a different gospel. And so uh, we must be on our guard, right? This, this passage, this sermon this morning is very much a warning, right? And uh, of course, this is leading into what, what you know, Paul, Paul will get into more specifics with uh, the people of Galatia in saying uh, what this is specifically that they're being deceived by. And we've kind of dipped our toe into that a little bit already this morning. But it's all... It's all uh, in the word, it's all this, this unchanging gospel. So as we come to a close, just let me say, uh, the, stakes, the stakes really are high. Because notice his wording here, right? To, to embrace a distorted gospel, well, to, to use the language of verse 6, is to desert him who called you into the grace of Christ. All right, you see that? Verse 6, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are now turning to a different gospel. So even a gospel distortion like we see here in Galatia, to embrace that gospel distortion is to desert him who called you in the grace of Christ. And then as far as those who preach such a gospel, again, we have these strong words, not once but twice, let him be accursed. And so that puts uh, quite a warning to teachers, teachers like myself. But praise God, the one true gospel of Jesus Christ is that he was cursed for us 
and paid the full penalty of our sin on the cross. Anyone who preaches the false gospel says, let him be accursed. Especially here in Galatia, uh, you know, this, these prerequisites, these, these other things that, uh, that the people were relying upon in addition to Christ's sacrifice. That in itself is to be cursed, Paul says. But the good news of the gospel is that if, if, we, if we just put our trust in Jesus and in Jesus alone... Well, we can, we can take comfort in the fact that Jesus was cursed for us. Cursed being one who hangs upon a tree, the scripture says. Um, or even, even as we saw in, um, well, I'm trying to remember the, the language from Romans. But, but essentially we see uh, that uh, he, was, he became a curse for us so that we can be saved. So, I've referred to uh, Jude's uh, doxology at the end of the book of Jude again uh, a few times in the sermon uh, when he calls for us to contend for the faith once and for all delivered to the saints. And so that's what I will leave you with this morning, that um, we, we must contend for the faith once and for all delivered to the saints. That is the unchanging gospel message. Uh, don't be deceived by distortions. Don't, uh, don't be deceived by false teachers. But rather, dig into the word and, uh, and, and don't, don't go to the left or to the right. But keep to uh, this gospel that Jesus paid it all. And that's good news. Uh, would a worship team uh, come forward? And uh, let me close this in prayer and then we'll sing together. God, we thank you that Jesus paid it all, that we don't have to rely upon ourselves. Um, Sometimes we have that tendency in our pride, but God, break us of our pride. Open our eyes to the, the truth of the gospel, the undiluted gospel, the undistorted gospel of Jesus Christ, and help us to beware of uh, the many distortions that are around us even today. Um, And then as we continue in the study, we see specifically uh, how the Galatians were being deceived. Lord, help us just to continue to draw from that, um, how this might apply to us today. And help us us to um, be transformed by the gospel for it to not just simply be ABCs that uh, maybe get us into the Christian faith, but uh, for it to be the the, the A to the Z of our lives and, uh, and for us to uh, never lose sight of it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand as we, Sing together. As we close? Uh...